We're delighted to bring you this seminar presented by LabRoots and in collaboration with the National Institute of Health. Welcome to our track on the NIH Brain Initiative, a multidisciplinary approach to neuroscience. We're glad you can join us for today's panel presentation titled Cracking in Neural Circuits Function Through High Resolution Physiology, Connectomics, and Computational Modeling. It's my pleasure to introduce a panel of experts who will be speaking on the topic of advancing human neuroscience. For a full listing, please click on the tab at the top of your screen. If any questions arise during the presentation, we encourage you to submit them in the Q&A box. Our speakers will respond back to you via email. As a reminder, this presentation is educational and offers free continuing education credits. Click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right corner of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming our panel of experts. Thank you for joining us. My name is Emre Aksai. A few things become abundantly clear when we look at these beautiful drawings from Ramoni Cajal of Golgi stained neurons in the brain. One, Cajal is a master, obviously. Two, the brain is extremely beautiful. Three, neurons and the networks in which they are embedded are frighteningly complex. One of the grand challenges today, I think, is to understand this complexity. Understanding this complexity is important, not only for our ability to be able to better treat diseases like epilepsy or Alzheimer's, but also to make advances in artificial intelligence where artificial neural networks are inspired or derived from our understanding of biological networks. Networks are, our exploration of neuroscience now has a number of tools available to it. On the physiology side, we can use electrophysiology, optophysiology, we can use quantitative behavioral analyses, a variety of anatomical tools and a range of computational modeling tools. However, each one of these tools by itself only looks at a facet of the complexity of the nervous system. Our approach has been to treat these tools as complementary and to uh, try to apply the tools in as much as possible the same setting so that the results from the efforts with one tool can be quickly translated to the results and compared with the results of the efforts with another tool. This tightly coupled approach, of course, requires a tightly coupled and integrated team. My laboratory focuses on physiology and behavior, large-scale imaging, targeted perturbations, our efforts in the laboratory for this project and what we're going to present today has been contributed primarily by Alex Ramirez. Sebastian Sung's laboratory uses the tools of serial section electron microscopy and connectomics, and we're joined today by uh, one of the principal uh, individuals in his laboratory who has led that work, Ashwin Vishwanathan. Mark Goldman's laboratory focuses on computational models and network inferencing, and we'll hear today from Mark about a lot of the work that Alex Sood has done. The plan for today is that first, Mark will provide an overview of the questions that we're most interested in and the theoretical background and the theoretical underpinnings of our experimental efforts. I will then build off of some of the predictions and background that he gave and give you recent results on the physiology and large-scale imaging that we've been able to accomplish in the zebrafish. That will feed directly into the efforts of the Sung Laboratory that will be presented on um, connectomics links between various neurons and within populations. And then Mark Goldman will come back and incorporate these data into the models that were introduced generate new predictions, I will then summarize in the end uh, with a few words. Mark, over to you. So the core scientific question we're going to be addressing today is how do neural circuits hold on to a short-term memory? To motivate this, I want to show an experiment from Renolfo Romo's lab on delay activity in the prefrontal cortex. 
In this experiment, a monkey had a vibration of a given frequency applied to its fingertip. There was then a delay period during which it needed to remember the frequency of this stimulus because after the delay period, the monkey was presented a second vibration to its fingertip and it needed to say whether the second vibration frequency was higher or lower in frequency than the first vibration. During these experiments, they recorded from the prefrontal cortex, and I'm showing you this activity here. So shown in red is the trace of one neuron recorded in the prefrontal cortex. Uh, the white dots on the top of the uh, graph are individual rasters from many different trials of individual neuronal firing. The red trace is showing the average of that smooth uh, out. And what you see is that during the delay period, there is this persistent neural activity which we believe is holding on to a memory of the vibration frequency applied to the fingertip before time zero. The reason that we think this persistent activity is encoding for the vibration frequency is because when they record following different frequencies of vibration applied to the fingertip, that's shown here. So for this neuron that was recorded, following a low frequency vibration applied to the fingertip, there was a low sustained firing rate and following a high frequency vibration applied to the fingertip, there was a high frequency of firing, a high rate of firing, and you can see the traces in between were for intermediate um, vibration frequencies that had to be remembered, again, so that they could be compared to the second stimulus. So this example actually illustrates uh, the type of activity we'll be looking at. And the Romo Group, in collaboration with Christian Mockins and Carlos Brody, also built a model for this, which I think is illustrative of the history of the field and the basic conceptual idea for what we think is the mechanism for maintaining such persistent activity. The key idea is that when a brief command, like the vibration to the fingertip, is applied, applied it causes currents to flow into a neuron. But a typical neuron in isolation, its firing rate would go up in response to such an input but then it would come down quickly on some neuronal or synaptic time scale, which is typically of order hundreds of milliseconds or less, as opposed to the six second delay period that you saw in the task. But of course, we know that neurons are not in isolation, they're part of networks. And the basic theory of how this persistent activity is maintained is that when a command input comes into a neuron, as looking at the neuron on the left, it begins firing, but then that neuron can convey convey signals to its neighbors and receive feedback from those neighbors through positive feedback pathways. These positive feedback pathways can be in two forms. There can be recurrent excitation where the neurons that were initially activated activate themselves and other similarly tuned neurons. And there also can be a double negative form of positive feedback where the neuron pool on the left inhibits the neuron pool on the right, which had previously been inhibiting them, therefore causing a double negative form of disinhibition, and again, allowing persistent activity to be maintained. And as shown in the bottom trace is a neuron receiving such network positive feedback when appropriately tuned can maintain persistent activity for a long duration, much longer than the time constant of an individual neuron or synapse. So that's a motivating example. We're going to actually show you work in a related system in terms of storing a short-term memory, but it's another type, it's a different type of analog memory system, and it's known as a neural integrator. So just to review from calculus, when I say integration, I mean integration in the sense of calculus. So shown in the top of this graph is an input stream, shown in red, and then this goes through in integration, and then the output shown in the bottom is the integral of this input. And a reminder that an integral from calculus is just a running total or a sum, sometimes just called an accumulator in the, psycholo in the psychology literature. So when you see this first brief pulse of input go in, the integrator accumulates that. And then, in, and then at the next time, time period, there is no input. So accumulating nothing is staying still. Another input comes in, it accumulates that. Then there's nothing coming in, so it stays still, and so on and so forth. And the accumulation can be of positive inputs or negative, which would correspond to inhibitory inputs, as shown at the end. So the key focus that we want to have today is that in the absence of input, an accumulator holds on to its running total. That is, it holds a memory of the running total of its past inputs. So integrators have been found to be incre incredibly uh, prevalent in the brain, underlying many different types of uh, core behaviors, 
In decision making, we believe that the core process of decision making is to accumulate noisy evidence over time. We see evidence of this in individual neuron recordings. And then the idea is that a decision is made when this accumulated evidence reaches a threshold. Likewise, in navigation, one of the key determinants of our position in the world is believed to be the integration of, of velocity signals indicating our movement through the world. For the rest of the talk, we're going to focus on a particular integration in the brain in the motor system, and it's going in, in an area of the brain known as the oculomotor neural integrator. And I'm going to show you a video of this um, activity here. In the video, what you will see is the movement of the uh, goldfish's eyes. The camera will zoom in, and you will see that when there is no visual stimulus for the, uh, for the uh, fish to track and its head is still, you'll see that it moves in a period, uh, in, a, in a sequence of saccades and fixations. Saccades are rapid eye movements that move the eyes between one place and another, and the fixations are just when the eye is held still. Video, please. So in the video I just showed you, you saw the animal's eyes moving back and forth. This is a cartoon of the uh, oculomotor neural integrator system for the control of eye position. On the bottom is shown an eye trace corresponding to what you just saw. The uh, fish holds its eyes at one position, then there's a rapid saccade to a neighboring position that's held, then a rapid saccade again, and so on and so forth. These saccades are created by eye velocity coding command neurons, which um, have brief bursts of firing. In this cartoon, I have just indicated in a positive direction excited, the output of excitatory burst neurons, which move the eyes one direction, and indicated with a negative a pulse the output of inhibitory pathways, which move the eyes the other direction. What I'd like to focus on here is that in order to maintain the eyes, which have spring-like muscles, there needs to be a constant force in the absence of any signal. That is to say, when there is no burst input, when there's no eye velocity command, in order to maintain the eyes at a given position, there needs to be some persistent driving signal generated from the nervous system. And it was identified many years ago that this is carried by an area of the brain known as the oculomotor integrator neurons. And I'm showing a recording of one of these neurons here in the middle panel. And what I'd like you to notice is that every time an input comes in, the firing rate is mathematically integrating, that is accumulating that signal to, main, to then go up to a higher persistent level of activity. So again, persistent activity in this system can be maintained at an analog set of levels corresponding to the analog range of eye positions that can be maintained, and it's storing the running total of the eye velocity input commands. Now for the rest of the talk, I won't show you the firing rate traces, but I'll rather show you tuning curves where we plot for any given eye fixation the firing rate of a neuron as a function of eye position. So for an example neuron, each of the dots here corresponds to one eye fixation. And you can see that the firing rate is very linear as a function of sustained eye position. And I should note that all of the recordings shown are done in the dark, so this activity is generated without visual feedback. So it needs to be that the activity is internally generated. Okay, so this is showing you one tuning curve of one neuron. But in fact, there's a whole population of neurons, and there's a beautiful organization in the fish oculomotor system where the right side neurons are like the ones I showed you. That is, the firing rates increase as the eyes move from left to right. And then on the opposite side of the brain, on the left side, the firing rates decrease from left to right. Statistically, the firing rates are equivalent. Here, I have literally just done a mirror image of the right side neurons and done a mirror image of them to show the left side neurons. But really, they're statistically the same. There's also, we think from gross anatomy, a beautiful uh, organization of these cells. So the cells are arranged on either side of the brain, on either side of the midline. 
Um, there are, is an excitatory and inhibitory population on either side. The, and the, neat, the interesting thing about these is they have exactly the connections one would expect from the theory of positive feedback leading to persistent activity. That is to say, on any given side of the brain, there are recurrent excitatory connections that are the ones that we think could maintain excitatory positive feedback. And between the two sides of the brain, there are recurrent inhibitory connections, those shown in blue here. And that means that one side of the brain can inhibit the side of the brain that was previously inhibiting it, again, forming a double negative form of positive feedback pathway. So given these, uh, this gross organization of the anatomy and given the known physiology at the time, this was done in the goldfish, we'll move forward to showing you our more recent work in the zebrafish, we built a model trying to understand exactly how this type of persistent activity is generated and in particular try to understand generate predictions for what the microstructure of this architecture is, as well as understanding the core macrostructure. In other words, is it the recurrent excitation, which is the primary driver of the persistent activity, or is it the recurrent disinhibition? And I'll say that the history of the field had proposed for theoretical reasons that it was disinhibition, but I'm going to show you that, in fact, we believe it's recurrent excitation within one side of the brain, which is the answer in this system. So our model is uh, sketched out here. So in the upper right, you see just a uh, caricature of the model with, again, the four populations of neurons that I showed you. There are about 100 neurons in this uh, brain region. There's about, we made 25 neurons per population. And the key thing that we wanted to model was the firing dynamics of each neuron. That is, how does the firing rate change over time, DRDT? And each of these terms corresponds to one contribution of that. So there are intrinsic properties of the cells characterized by the intrinsic leak, that's minus F of R. And then what's offsetting this intrinsic leak and driving the cells is same side excitation. We model that as a weighted sum with weight Wij going through a synapse, which can have a nonlinearity S of the input R. That is, an input R is driving, an input R from neuron J is driving the output of neuron I through first a synaptic nonlinearity and then an overall strength of that connection, and we sum that up for all inputs. Likewise, we said that from the anatomy, there is inhibition coming from the, upper, from the opposite side, which we model in the same way. There is also tonic background inputs coming into these, and the burst commands represents those saccata commands which move the eyes from one place to another. So the question is, how out of a set of equations like this can one, one get an integrator? And, I, and in particular, how can one maintain persistent activity in the absence of the burst command? That is, when the burst command is zero, we want to have persistent activity. Persistent activity would correspond to drdt equals zero, no change over time in the firing rate. And that occurs when all of these terms up to the burst command must sum to zero. When they sum to zero, drdt equals zero. There's persistent activity in the absence of the burst command. But what I'd like you to notice is if these terms all sum to zero, then we have that the derivative of the firing rate is proportional to the burst command. And if we have that the derivative of the firing rate is proportional to the burst command, then from calculus, we have that the firing rate is proportional to the integral of the burst command. So we fundamentally think that this is how integrators are created in the brain. That is to say that integrators are created when there is a balance of excitatory and inhibitory in recurrent, kind of recurrent inputs and uh, offset, sorry, recurrent inputs that offset the intrinsic leak and therefore allow persistent activity to be maintained and burst commands to be integrated. So we set out to, to fit this model to data from the uh, goldfish. We actually built a conductance-based model that was fit by a cost function approach. And the cost function, I won't go through the details, but it had different terms in it which penalized different errors in modeling different aspects of the experiments. So we had intracellular current injection experiments that I will not show, the database of single neuron tuning curves that I showed you, and firing rate drift patterns following focal lesions. And we wanted to bring all of these together within one modeling framework. To be clear, the knowns in this framework are the recorded firing rates and the intrinsic responses, F of R, from the single neuron current injection experiments. The unknowns, as in many systems, are the synaptic weights and the external inputs. Also unknown is the exact form of the synaptic or dendritic nonlinearities, S excitatory and S inhibitory. And I refer you to our paper from 2013 to see the details of the fitting method. What I want to show you here is just that the fitting method works. 
So this is actually showing you on the top an example model neuron voltage trace from the full conductance based model. You can see a psychotic input coming in with a brief pulse that drives an immediate uh, change in firing rate of the neuron. But then importantly, what I want you to notice is before that first psychotic pulse, the firing rate was zero. After the pulse, you can see the persistent activity. A second pulse comes in, and following that second pulse, it has been integrated because there is a higher rate of persistent activity. We then just plotted the firing rates of neurons like this, like this one. It's actually, I'm showing you a different neuron, and that's shown in the lower left. In the lower left, you see firing rate as a function of time. Gray was the raw firing rate in the model. Black is what you would see in most experimental papers where we've run this through a smoothing filter just to make it clear what the pattern is. And green is just highlighting a perfect integral. So the model is perfectly integrating the external inputs. We could actually do this and per nearly perfectly fit the tuning curve of every single neuron in our database of recordings. And that's shown in the lower, lower right. So the lines in this case are the tuning curves from the data that I showed you. The boxes are at each individual eye position that the uh, simulated eye went to, what the firing rate was, plus the noise, because we also tried to model the variability in this system, which is a different story I will not talk about today. OK, so I want to now step to what insights did we get from this modeling exercise. And the insights came most strongly from the following experiment, and it was the inactivation experiment. So in this set of experiments, which came from, which uh, were done by Emery Oxai uh, in David Tank's lab, they inactivated the left side of the integrator while recording neurons on the right side of the integrator. And what you see on the right side of the slide is the drift firing pattern caused by this. Now I want to remind you that the connections between the two sides of the circuit are mediated by inhibition. So we said that to maintain persistent activity, there needed to be a balance of excitation net excitation offsetting the intrinsic leak. So if there was a balance of inputs allowing persistent activity, removing the inhibition coming from the contralateral side of the circuit onto a given neuron, we would expect to make the firing rates drift upwards because now they have been, their inputs are imbalanced by having a lot, lack of inhibition. So you expect, again, the firing rates to increase. And that's exactly what we saw at low firing rates. However, puzzlingly, at high firing rates, you can see that the activity maintained its persistence. And that was not to be expected because, again, we expected to have a loss of inhibitory, in a removal of inhibitory input, and therefore we expected to have a firing rate drift upwards at all possible firing rates. Well, we found that we could reproduce this in the model, which is being shown here below, under certain conditions. So we found that we basically reasoned that when the neurons on the right side of the circuit are at high firing rates, recall the tuning curves that right side neurons increase their firing rates as the eyes move from left to right. Left side neurons decrease their firing rates as the eyes move from left to right. Therefore, when a right side neuron is at high firing rates, that means the left side neurons in a fully intact circuit would have been at low firing rates. So these high firing rates occur when the inactivated side would be at low firing rates. However, there still would be firing rates and there still would be activity. So what the modeling suggested is that such low rates are below a threshold for contributing. That is removing low rate firing is not sufficient to disrupt the persistent activity. And there are many biophysical mechanisms that we considered for this. For example, a strong presynaptic facilitation could contribute, postsynaptically something like an NMDA channel, which is known to be prevalent in this circuit, may need to be present in order to cause a NMDA spike. And again, that would have a threshold. So there are many biophysical processes. But for this talk, what I really want to emphasize is that the low rates appear to be below a threshold for contributing. And that allows stable firing act of activity at high firing, firing rates. And importantly, what this says is that each side of the integrator independently can maintain persistent activity on its own at high firing rates. What we think the inhibition does is coordinates the two sides so that really the high firing rate side is the driver of activity, and then that is just holding the other sides at its low firing rates. And really, the, uh, the low firing rate side is the follower. I now wanted to step back and put this all together and say, what does this imply about the question that I opened with? Is it recurrent excitation or recurrent inhibition, which maintains persistent activity in this system?
So consider, as shown here, network activity when the eyes are directed rightward. When the eyes are directed rightward, what we just said is the right side neurons are at high firing rate and above threshold for transmitting to their neighbors. So this means that, for example, the right side recurrent excitatory loop would be present and that would be a form of positive feedback contributing to persistent activity. But now consider those left side neurons. Those left side neurons we just argued are below threshold for contributing. Therefore, even though anatomically they are, there is a projection from the left to the right side, we believe that when the eyes are directed rightward, as highlighted by these dashed lines, the functional connectivity is such that there is no con connectivity going from the left to the right. Again, the left side is at low rates that we believe are below threshold. That means there is no mutual inhibitory feedback loop between the two sides at any given point in time. And therefore, we believe that in a bit disinhibition or the double negative potential form of positive feedback loop is not present. So the conclusion is that excitation, not inhibition, maintains persistent activity. And inhibition is anatomically recurrent, but functionally forward, so functionally feed forward. And this is actually going to guide some of our future experiments. The other thing I want to point out is this picture right here is just a gross reduction of the circuit to just four populations as four lump sums. But we wanted to understand what about the rich microcircuitry within each of these populations. And when we went to do that, we realized there was a potential problem. And the potential problem is that there are about 100 neurons in this circuit, and therefore there are about 10, 100 times 100 or 10,000 potential synaptic connections. So that means in terms of modeling, there's going to be a greatly overspecified model, what we call a non-identifiability problem. So we wanted to be able to say, well, what features of the connectivity are important and what features of the connectivity are not important? And can we formally say something about that from the experiments that have been conducted? So what we did is we did a sensitivity analysis to determine which features of the connectivity are most critical. And the idea is our model, I mentioned, was built through a cost function. And this is just showing a cartoon cost function, showing potential to the model cost function surface for two hypothetical parameters. In this case, along the green direction, if that parameter of the model, which you could think of as something like a synaptic weight, was changed, that caused a great error in the model fit. There is a strong curvature. On the other hand, in the red direction, that is a direction uh, which is insensitive. If that parameter of the model is changed, Almost nothing happens to the cost function, and that one is insensitive and could be tuned at many different values and still lead to the same, approximately the same model performance. The way we capture such curvature in a cost function is through the Hessian matrix of second derivatives, d squared cost, dwi, dwj, where each of those w's is one of the individual weight parameters, of which there are 5,000 potential connections, 10,000 up to restrictions of neurons having to go to one side, which reduces that by two. What you can do to find out what the important sensitive directions are is do a principal components analysis of this matrix. That is, find the eigenvectors. So an eigenvector of this uh, Hessian matrix identifies the patterns of weight changes to which the system is most sensitive. The most sensitive ones are the ones with the largest eigenvalues, which corresponds to the strongest curvature. And when we did this, surprisingly, we found that there were only four most sensitive components that are per neuron. So for the fits to any given neuron, and the fits and the components, I should say, were quite similar across neurons. So essentially, what this is saying is there are really only four combinations of weights, not individual weights, but for combinations or patterns of weights that were really important to maintain the tuning of the circuit and be able to reproduce the experimental data. And that's highlighted in the next slide. I'm going to go through this briefly, but briefly speaking, here is showing some of the sensitive, sensitive directions and what is being shown in the top row here. So take the top left, it's the first principal component. What this says is positive is making connections more or more excitatory or less inhibitory. So the numbers 1 through 50 on the bottom is describing for one postsynaptic uh, neuron, it has 50 presynaptic inputs, 25 of those are excitatory, 25 are inhibitory, and what's being done in this principal component is, raise, is increasing the excitatory connection strengths and decreasing or removing inhibition 
from the inhibitory conduction strengths. And you can see below this, if you perturb that direction by making this change in the weights, it causes the firing rates to run off to a saturation level. The second most important component was what happens if one decreases excitation and then also decreases inhibition. That led to what we can call a leaky integrator, where you can see all of the activities below look like they are exponentially decaying to a single steady state. And then there were two components, components three and four, which related to the specific thresholds of the neurons, high threshold neurons versus low threshold neurons, low threshold neurons firing throughout the eye position range, high threshold ones, ones that recruited only, only through part, only were recruited as the eyes moved from left to right after the eyes had moved through part of the range. And in that case, there were distinct patterns that if you perturbed those, disrupted those patterns, that also led to drift patterns like the one you see below. What I'd really like to highlight for you is on the right. This is the 10th most important component um, out of the 50 components. And you can see that clusters of excitatory and clusters of inhibitory uh, connections were either turned up or turned down. Nevertheless, perturbing by the exactly the same magnitude, vector magnitude, as the other perturbations I'm showing you led to almost no change in the persistent activity. And that's seen below. Why is that? Well, ultimately, that's because there are offsetting effects. So if you think of a given neuron, what we've done is we've effectively turned up excitatory input and turned up inhibitory input in a way that those cancel, or maybe turned up some excitatory inputs and turned down other excitatory inputs in, again, a way that those cancel. And when you think about these insensitive components, it has a tremendous uh, implication for how we think about circuits and what we really can conclude from any given circuit model uh, Often in modeling, we like to put out our best fit, our maximum likelihood model. And I wanted to show you what we think maybe is, is you know, a real issue for doing that and maybe how we instead should think about what the important sensitive directions are and really distinguish, let those be what's important and distinguish that from directions that are insensitive. And this you know, whole framework we think really lets you say what was important, what isn't important. And this slide here really emphasizes what isn't important. So what I've laid out here is the connectome in, a, in our model neuron. This is, again, 100 neurons. They're organized in uh, groups. Uh, the red connections are the excitatory populations. The blue are the inhibitory populations. The first 50 neurons are on the left side of the brain. The second 50 neurons are on the right side of the brain. So for example, the upper left block would be talking about left side neurons connecting recurrently to each other. And the examples connectome I show you on the left, it is statistically something like all to all connectivity. There's a little, you know, there are some details in there, but basically everything is connecting to everything. By contrast, look at the circuit on the right. In this case, this is a circuit with very local connectivity. And here we actually assigned anatomical locations to each neuron in anticipation of the zebrafish experiments that you'll see momentarily. And here, this one, you can see that the connectivity is clustered around the diagonal of each block for excitation. So that corresponds to lo spatially local recurrent connectivity. Now I want to show you the responses of neurons on the bottom. So what I'm showing you here is actually just the pooled responses summing up all the right side neurons in black or summing up all the left side neurons in gray, but it actually holds for individual neurons as well. And uh, again, in both networks, it integrates. The pink and orange traces are just indicating a perfect integral. And I would challenge you in a psychophysics experiment to be able to distinguish between these two. Literally every nook and cranny of these traces is essentially identical. And that says that fundamentally, here are two extremely different network architectures leading to nearly identical performance. How can we explain some data like this and what's going on in the model? And the way we explain it is we go back to thinking of our sensitive and our insensitive directions. So what we did, did is we actually took the difference between the connectivities. We took the connectivity in the left, subtracted it, subtracted the connectivity in the right, and then projected the differences between the two connectivities along the sensitive and insensitive eigenvector directions. And that's shown here. So this is showing the difference between the circuits along each components. So what you'll notice is that recall that there were only four sensitive directions that were important for determining the function and the output of this circuit and matching the experiments. And these first four components that were important 
between these two circuits that I'm showing, their difference is exponentially small. Note that the y-axis in this graph is logarithmic. That means that the difference between these two circuits is someplace between e to the minus eight and e to the minus 10 in difference. That is, these are virtually identical in terms of what's important for determining the function of the circuit. The other components that are more different between them and lead to the visual differences in the top and the topographic differences are along the insensitive directions. The other thing that I want to point out is this says that we need to clearly dive in and do more experiments if we really want to understand how this circuit works. We now have two very, very different architectures, a nearly all-to-all -all connected network on the left and a very locally modularly connected network on the right. So to summarize our lessons learned from this part of the talk, first, in terms of the gross anatomy and the gross structure of this architecture, what we have shown is that recurrent excitation we, is what we believe generates persistent act firing, and the recurrent inhibition is used to coordinate the two sides that can generate their persistent activity independently. But if we want to understand just what generates the persistent activity, we really only need to understand one half of the network, and we can look at one half of the network in isolation because we know it generates persistent activity on its own. That is a motivation for some of the experiments that will follow. The second key conclusion from this part of the talk is that we clearly need much richer anatomical information to understand truly what patterns of excitation underlie the persistent function. Thank you, Mark. Uh, I think that uh, very nicely summarizes a long series of experimental work that allowed us to develop a biophysically realistic and rich model of the system which then has led to predictions that uh, really now forces us experimentally to take things to another level and to go to a high throughput strategy where we can look at the activity of mini cells and the connectivity of mini cells uh, really in uh, one brain at one time. To do this, what we have done is to transition to the larval zebrafish preparation where the small size of the animal the robust behavior of the animal in combination with tools like two photon microscopy as shown on the left have allowed us now to look at large scale at mini neurons at high resolution. So on the video we're going to see at the right, we're going to show you multiple planes taken through the zebrafish uh, brain uh, in the live animal. The green channel will show the nuclear localized GCAM signal, which is a calcium sensor, a fast calcium sensor that serves as a good proxy for the firing rate activity of with, uh, in a particular cell. And you're also going to have on the red channel uh, an indication of where the uh, excitatory, uh, the glutamatergic neurons are uh, located. So with this now exquisite resolution and uh, spatial coverage of large regions of the brain, we can build uh, beautiful dynamical maps of the activity throughout the oculomotor circuit during a uh, behavior. In this video, uh, we're going to see now, we're going to look at the activity projected on, across the brain onto the horizontal plane at top and then onto the sagittal plane from all the neurons on the left and all the neurons on the right, as the eye position is transitioning from one location to the other. And I'll get into the details of uh, what the individual neurons are doing next, but this is, this is simply to help illustrate the power of this approach. Among the broad uh, distribution of activity profiles that you saw there, one of the major classes were these neurons that show a step-like change in activity or firing rate as the eyes move from one position to another. Of course, a large contribution to that uh, population comes from the integrator neurons. There are also neurons associated with the motor system that we'll talk about in a second. The uh, traces at the top show the rasters associated with individual saccadic events from a single neuron as you move from the right to the left. And in the second uh, row, second uh, box, we're looking at movements from the left to the right. Okay. The rapid uh, transitions at time zero then uh, 
are somewhat filtered due to the dynamics of the calcium buffering within the system. Um, but uh, we know from simultaneous recordings with uh, firing rates that uh, these transitions are ac accurately uh, reflecting the underlying changes, changes in, in the action potentials. Next slide. In the next slide, then, we see another type of uh, activity that's prevalent within this uh, population or in this uh, oculomotor region, and those are neurons associated with psychotic events, and they show a burst response, uh, very transient and very sharp at each uh, individual psychotic event. And through this exploratory process, we have also discovered novel cells that we had not expected. For example, these neurons that show a long ramp in activity ahead of a saccade. And we know from work uh, that Alex Ramirez has done that these are involved in the planning of the next saccadic uh, uh, event itself. By doing this large scale approach, we are now able to look at where these different activity uh, associated neurons, behaviorally associated neurons, where they're located, and that allows us then to start to specify the functional identity in the oculomotor circuit, which allows it annotations that inform then the connectomics work that we're gonna see next. So in this video, what you're gonna look at is the locations of cells that are increasing their firing rates with every movement to the left and increasing and maintaining the uh, activity throughout the leftward fixation. So some of the neurons that we see in that three-dimensional uh, map, we're able to identify simply based on the locations. So for example, the neurons that are at the right side of this image, this particular plane taken uh, fairly ventral in the zebrafish brain, are cells that are residing within the inferior olive, which is easily identified through its uh, location. Other populations, like the abducens motor neurons, can be identified through registration between the functionally imaged brain and brains where uh, neurons associated with different transgenic lines have been identified and where previous work has specified what type of role that neuron plays. So here we can look at the MNX1 uh, GFP line where motor neurons have been identified, where we can see also the nerve that presents to the lateral rectus muscle that controls the eyes themselves. And so the overlap that you're seeing in the uh, lower portion of the brain suggests to us that uh, the neurons associated with leftward activity that now overlap with the uh, teal signal, or the um, cyan signal, are in fact the motor neurons themselves. Other regions of the brain have not as well been as characterized as well. Those populations, then we need to take a combined approach where we look at uh, first some single cell structure function information, where we label neurons that show a particular pattern of activity with dyes that allow us to see where their axons project to. And so what you're looking at on the right are a population of six neurons that have been individually labeled, and we can see their axons projecting to the abducens. And these have now the appropriate anatomical projection patterns that we would expect of a pre-motor neuron class that is involved in integration. We can also now register this, uh, these maps with maps that have previously determined where different excitatory or inhibitory neuron classes are. And we can specify which of the neurons that have the fixation signal are GABAergic, which are glutamatergic, et cetera. We can also do targeted ablation experiments. Here, ablating some of the cells within the Rummier 7-8 caudal portions of the hindbrain uh, 
and showing that as expected for deficits uh, in a neural integrator, the eye movements following ablation are quite a bit more leaky or drifting towards a neutral position than in the, in the situation in the control case, in the upper before case. We can also do transient perturbation experiments here using a fiber optic to stimulate halorhodopsin in a fraction of the cells within the Ramir 7-8 fixation zone. And here now we see the expected deflection in eye position, sustained deflection following a transient suppression of activity within the uh, fixation neuron complex or what we think is the integrator neuron complex within Romimir 7-8. These combined strategies have allowed us to now identify throughout the oculomotor circuit a number of the key elements, a number of the key players, including the psychotic burst neurons, the motor neurons, vestibular neurons, cerebellar granule cells, inferior olive, as I showed you. We've also been able to build maps of the projections between one group of neurons and another, and out outlines for us in broad terms the oculomotor circuit. However, we need to move beyond these broad outlines to answer the kinds of questions that Mark was raising. And for that, we can now use the annotation that's been done to couple with a connectomics effort that's uh, spearheaded by the work of Sebastian Sun. Hi, I'm Sebastian Sung, and as Emery promised, I'm going to tell you a little bit, or at least introduce to you, uh, the idea of using connectomics to constrain uh, models of neural network function. So as Mark showed you in his beautiful modeling work, um, his models make a number of predictions about both neural activity and the connectivity of the network. Uh, for a long time, it's been very difficult to get very precise information about connections between individual neurons. Um, but luckily, the technologies of connectomics have, uh, have come to the rescue. There's been a lot of progress in recent years on methods of automated acquisitions of EM volumes, three-dimensional electron microscopy volumes. Uh, and there's also been progress in applying deep learning and crowdsourcing in order to create reconstructions of the neural circuits that are imaged in those volumes. Uh, and in addition, it's been possible to combine um, electron microscopy with calcium imaging. So uh, senior scientist Ashwin Vishwanathan is going to tell you about an experiment in which uh, a, a larval zebrafish that was calcium imaged in emery oxide's lab, uh, that those neurons, those exact same neurons, uh, were imaged using electron microscopy and reconstructed uh, to give us information about circuitry. So at this point, I'll hand it over to Ashwin, who's going to tell you the story of um, the circuits involved in ocular motor function. Uh, thank you for that introduction, Sebastian. So as um, uh, Mark had pointed out previously, we would like to um, constrain some of the work, some of the models that uh, uh, his work has generated. And the gold standard for doing something like this is electron microscopy. So with electron microscopy, you have the resolution that um, affords, you know, visualization of individual synapses. So you can not only reconstruct the entire morphologies of neurons, you can also reconstruct and see the, their partners, their connected partners. And so to do this in an automatic manner, we use this contraption that was developed in the lab of Jeff Lickman at Harvard. Uh, essentially, this machine is like a conveyor belt, which collects sections that are being sectioned on, a serial, uh, on an ultramicrotome. So every time um, uh, the ultramicrotome arm moves, it generates a new section, and these sections are picked up on this conveyor belt. Now we can collect many such sections uh, and put it on a silicon wafer and we can image them under the electron microscope. So to the left is the kind of the overview of one such silicon wafer where you can see small tiny dots. 
And if you zoom into each one of these small, small tiny dots, you can see a sliver of um, uh, or an individual frame of the larval zebrafish. And then for, from each one of these low resolution images, you can then target the region of interest to be acquired at higher resolution. And for, for the purposes uh, of this particular experiment, we targeted uh, one side of the brain. In this case, it's the right side of the brain. As Mark had previously pointed out, uh, we think that it's um, the recurrent excitation on one side is largely driving persistent activity. So we chose to um, restrict our volumes to one side of the brain. Now, um, we, we can acquire many thousands and thousands of these electron microscopic images we can stitch all these images together and put them together in a, in a three-dimensional volume. And since this animal was previously imaged on a two-photon um, microscope uh, for, calcium, uh, for calcium indicator, we can then correlate the same cells for which we have calcium imaging. So we have function for these cells from two-photon imaging and find the same cells within the serial electron microscopic volume. So to, to, the two images that you see on the left one is from the two photon functional imaging and one image is from the serial electron microscope. And the red arrows over here are pointing to cell bodies for which we actually have calcium imaging. So we have a uh, function and then we can locate the same cell bodies in the serial EM and reconstruct them and also recover the morphology of the same neurons. Um, so now it is not enough just to reconstruct the neurons for which we have functional imaging. We'd also like to reconstruct who their partners are. And so historically, this effort has been kind of a very time-consuming effort because um, reconstructing neurons from electron microscopy is, is extremely hard. It's not a task that can be undertaken by an individual or maybe even a lab, but would need uh, a lots of people in a large community. And so to do this, we, we turned to kind of automating this process. Uh, and we, we leveraged the tools coming out from computer science world we used deep learning or machine learning assisted reconstructions. So let me walk you through uh, what exactly this pipeline looks like. So we use convolutional neural nets or CNNs uh, in this case, and the pipeline looks something like this. We start off with an image, which is the raw image over here or the raw image of the EM. We then detect the boundaries for each one of the neurites inside this image. So that's the image in the middle. And all the pixels within the boundaries uh, of one particular neuride are assigned to a single object. So each color over there you see is a single object. So now the cartoon that the pictures that I'm showing over here are all in two dimensions, but in reality, this process is happening in three dimensions. So, so by doing this process, essentially we're, we're reconstructing large three-dimensional objects, uh, each, each of them neurides that are belonging to individual neurons. Now we can uh, we can do a similar such approach for even for detecting synaptic junctions. So synaptic junctions are junctions uh, where two neurons are communicating to each other. And a classic hallmark of locating these junctions are postsynaptic densities or PSDs. So we we run another convolutional neural net on images to detect the PSDs. And at each one of these locations, we can then also assign who the presynaptic and the postsynaptic partner of these neurons are. So by doing this process, we can not only reconstruct uh, thousands and thousands of neurons within the EM volume, you can also then uh, reconstruct, you can, you can also automatically detect where all the synapses are, and you can also detect kind of the edges between these neurons. So in, in, in essence, you can, you can think of this like a large graph where each neuron is a single node and, you can, uh, and the synapses are basically the, the weights and the edges between these nodes. But there is one problem with this approach, which is um, very often neural nets also do uh, end up making mistakes. And the mistakes typically happen in areas where maybe there was an image defect or the image acquisition was not perfect. And so typically that manifests, the way that manifests is, um, for example, uh, if two objects needed to be connected to each other to form a large, uh, a, a single neuron, and if there was an image defect, uh, then those two objects would be broken apart or sometimes they would be merged falsely. So in essence, we would like to kind of validate or we would like to proofread what the output of these um, um, deep learning methods are providing us. And, and to do this, we turn to um, a crowdsourced platform. This is a, this is a crowdsourced effort uh, 
uh, developed in the lab of Sebastian Sun called iWire. Originally, this was developed for uh, reconstructing neurons from a retina database. We have now repurposed this website to validate neurons that are coming out for the, for, from the larval zebrafish. So in essence, um, so here's an image of the landing page of this particular website. Uh, players can basically log in online and look at completed neurons, like in the picture over here, the blue neuron that you see. They can then individually inspect each one of these nubs on the neuron to either decide to whether join more nubs to the existing neuron or remove nubs from the existing neuron. And they can do this in an iterative manner and, may, and, and, and this process is repeated over and over again until we build a consensus as to what the accurate representation of the neuron is. And so once that's been done and experts look at it, we then say that this neuron is validated and then we move on to the next neuron. So using this process, we have now reconstructed over 3,000 such neurons from the larval zebrafish. Right, so, um, so then we would like to, uh, so now, so now that armed with this, we have now about 3,000 neurons, like I said, we would like to be able to classify these neurons. So here's one example, um, and I'm gonna present the same example as the abducens motor neurons that uh, Emery Oxide spoke about previously. So the abducens motor neurons are motor neurons that project to the eye muscle, so they're directly involved in moving the eye. So from the EM, we can reconstruct cell bodies, we can reconstruct the dendrites, and the axons that are eventually gonna to project to the motor neurons. Uh, we can also see that they're, they're located roughly in the same area where we think they're located, which is in rhombomeres R5 and R6. So this is one way of identifying neurons by morphology. So I'm calling this structural identification. Another way of identifying neurons is by their function. Since we know that abducens motor neurons are directly involved in moving the eye, we know that they should also have a functional signature of the eye movement that they're gonna make. In essence, if the animal was moving its eye and the animal had calcium uh, reporters in there, abducens motor neurons should also report eye movement. And that's exactly what we see. Uh, if you register all the reconstructions to a standard uh, atlas, uh, the location where we see the abducens motor neurons in the green dots, for example, in the sagittal plane, is exactly the same location where we see um, calcium signals for eye positions, which is the black dots. So if you look at the two coronal planes um, at each one of these sagittal locations, you see that the uh, locations of the cell bodies, which is the green circles, overlaps very nicely with where we see calcium imaging from eye position sensitive neurons. So these are neurons that are active when the animal is moving its eye and that's exactly where we see the motor neurons. So this gives us confidence both structurally as well as functionally that the neurons that we've classified are in fact the abducens motor neurons. So this is just one example of a population of neurons that we've reconstructed. But in essence, we've done this process for many such populations. And here is kind of a summary of the many different populations that we've reconstructed. Excuse me. So for, we have uh, we have reconstructed and validated neurons that are belonging to the vestibular class of neurons. So that's descending octaval neurons and medial octaval neurons. We've reconstructed axons from the saccadic burst neuron population as well as the inhibitory ne neuron population. And within the neural integrator population as well, we've we've been able to kind of classify these neurons based on uh, their morphology as well as their spatial location. For example, we see integrator neurons located in, in rhombomeres four through six. We also see integrator neurons in rhombomeres seven and eight. Some of them have axons that stay on the same side of the brain, which is the recurrent excitation that Mark had initially shown in his model, the blue, the, uh, the blue model, the, the blue cartoon. Uh, and then we also have um, neurons that have axons that project to the opposite side of the brain that provide the disinhibition, which was the red cartoon that Mark had previously shown in the brain. Now we can put all of this together from each the, the neurons from each one of these classes together in a matrix or a, the connectivity matrix, the connectome, such that each row over here are, is the is the dendrite of a single neuron, and each column is the axon of the same neuron, and each dot that you see uh, is the normalized number of synapses from that particular axon to that particular neuron. And so you can see that you start, you start seeing some structure in this network. You see that the saccadic neurons 
uh, are projecting to the integrator neurons, which is in blue, and they're also projecting to the motor neurons. You see that the vestibular neurons also project to integrator neurons and the motor neurons. And then you also see the integrator neurons that project onto other integrator neurons as well as the motor neurons. So, so um, as 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 was predicted by the theory, and um, and this has been a kind of an open-ended question in the field for a long time, is positive feedback truly a mode for excitation? Uh, and our results seem to validate that fact. We see a recurrent block just among the. If you if you follow the diagonal, you see that just the blue block, which is the integrators, have this large recurrent component. Another interesting feature that we see from a, such a such a connectivity matrix is this modular organization. So we see uh, different modules being uh, created when you see the feed forward. So from the integrators onto the motor neurons, you see some integrators exclusively talk to motor neurons, whereas other integrator neurons exclusively talk to internuclear neurons. So there's this modular organization. And then even within the integrator recurrent block, the red block, you see that if you follow the diagonal, you see that there is hints of this modular organization, like what Mark had shown in previously in one of his uh, one of his experimental graphs. So, so the, we have a fairly updated version of what did we think the um, the the ocular motor circuit looks like. We've been able to um, identify neurons in each one of these key populations. We also know the connectivity amongst neurons in these key populations and between neurons in these key populations. With arm, so now armed with this information and armed with the connectivity matrix, we can go back and revisit some of the modeling uh, and plug this kind of this weight matrix into the models and ask uh, how exactly do the models perform? Okay, Mark, over to you. So thank you, Ashwin. So. Given this connectomic information, we wanted to revisit our models. Recall that our previous models really only allowed us to draw very conclusions about the gross structure of the integrator, but really didn't allow us to first look at the microstructure of the neural integrator. And second, our previous models were only focused on the neural integrator themselves and not on the other associated regions of the oculomotor hindbrain. So what we asked to start was, what if we just take a simple linear rate model? This has some reasonable justification that there are linear uh, tuning curves and linear firing rates and high background firing rates throughout the oculomotor system. But also, now that we are trying to look at an expanded question, we also just started with the simplest model, which is a linear model. And we took this linear model and we said, what if we just directly put in the connectome as our weight matrix, plus known signs of the connections from the physiology. Would that alone be able to reproduce the measured sensitivities to eye position of the oculomotor integrate of the oculomotor hindbrain neurons? And remarkably, I'm going to show you that it did. So this is showing you what came out of the model. And what you'll notice is across these four prominent populations that showed up in the uh, connectome in which we analyzed, you see that different neurons have different tuning curve relationships firing rate from versus eye position. So in particular, the integrator neurons are shown in dark yellow, and those are the ones we talked about before. We found that just from the raw connectome that the abducens motor neurons and the abducens internuclear neurons should have more sensitivity to eye position. And we found that the, the vestibular neurons should have nearly zero sensitivity to eye position. So we then, after doing this, went back and looked at the literature, both in the fish and across different species. And here's what we found. So I should say, just for truth uh, and in explaining this, that we first had to fix one parameter, which is we needed to take our model. And for our integrator uh, slope of the tuning curve, there's a free parameter of how strongly the inputs connect to the outputs. That was the parameter B in the previous slide. And we just set our model prediction equal to the macaque integrator slope of the firing rate as a function of eye position. However, every other point that you see in this graph was emergent. And what you see is that the predictions from the model, just directly from the connectome, match incredibly well with the actual measured um, sensitivities of neurons throughout the oculomotor system to eye position. In green is shown the goldfish, and you can see that black, the model predictions, are nearly exactly in agreement with the goldfish, which is the closest species to the zebrafish that these were recorded on, but that there's also consistency across the different species.
So I'm going to leave that there and hand this off to Emery to summarize what we believe we've learned from this project in its entirety and where we're going next. Thank you, Mark. In summary, what we've shown you is a multifaceted approach where we've been able to uh, use large-scale imaging tools to functionally identify key circuit elements throughout the oculomotor circuit, to use a large-scale connectomics approach to identify the key connections, key circuit uh, interactions between and within the elements identified above. And we've developed a theoretical framework that ties together the functional and anatomical data to develop a deeper mechanistic understanding of how this neural system functions. We're also very interested in the prospects of doing combined light and electron microscopy where uh, both molecular and ultrastructural integrity are preserved. And we think this kind of approach, uh, an example here being developed in the Lichtman Laboratory, where they use fragments of, uh, fragments of antibodies called nanobodies or intrabodies that are able to penetrate through the tissue and allow for preservation of ultrastructural detail, provides the capacity to now, at an individual neuron level, identify a neurotransmitter class, look at protein distributions, that will speak to neuronal excitability. So together, we think this information will provide a much richer data set and much deeper understanding of the mechanisms underlying circuit dynamics. I'd like to acknowledge the following individuals from the laboratory and the funding sources listed below. Thank you for your time and we look forward to your questions and any comments. Thank you for that outstanding presentation. For additional panels on the NIH Brain Initiative, a multidisciplinary approach to neuroscience, please view our agenda on our events page. As a final reminder, the panelists will follow up with any questions via email. Thank you again for your participation.